Thank you, Rory. Now, uh, when we started on this with our uh, first publication, uh, Behavioral Economics, Red Hot, Red Hot or Red Herring, we outlined seven, I mean, there was obviously going to be a longer list, but seven reasons or seven things we thought people might do with behavioral economics. But the truth was, at that point, we were, it was, it was a, it was, a, it was a, a guess. I mean, it was an intelligent guess, and we were trying hard. But we didn't actually know what people would do with it. What's exciting now is that with the passing of time and the submission of case studies, we know what people have done. And in the, by scanning through every... So you may, may not realise this if you've not written an IPA <laughs> paper. When you submit your paper, you fill in a questionnaire where you answer lots of questions about the ambitions of the campaign and what you're trying to do and this, that and the other. And in there now is the thing where it asks if you've used behavioural economics and how you've used it. So if you ticked one of those boxes, I read through your paper. And there were a lot of those papers, right? So, as I said, many, many, an exciting afternoon. There was 68, right? So, I've read more IPA papers than that over the years, but there you are, I don't get out enough. Right? So, but I read those, those, and from those, it was possible to get a feel for the different ways, or the sort of common themes that are emerging, how people actually use behavioral economics. So, if we could, this is the big reveal, right? this is the big moment in the publication. These are the five sort of uh, abiding areas that seem to be influences. So, oh, I can drive my own charts from up here, can't I? There we are. So. They are, so the five are. No, the first is what I've called uh, big nudges. So these were, um, the, if you're not uh, familiar with, uh, then you should read Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein's book, Nudge. But that uh, suggested that there were, um, that thing was things like if you wanted more people to be organ donors, that the simplest thing to do was to create a system where you assumed people were an organ donor unless they said no. And this would take participation up to extremely high levels overnight, right? So it was a single intervention which have a very large effect. Now, it turns out there, there are effects like that available, but they're not actually that common. Uh, and advertising does produce them, and advertising campaigns seeks to do them. Uh, and the examples in the publication are the British Heart Foundation's Vinnie Jones campaign, and there's a fire safety campaign which encourage people to uh, check their fire, their smoke alarms, sorry, their smoke alarms when the clocks go backwards and forwards, uh, the beginning and end of British summertime. Uh, it's also a great example of piggybacking an existing behavior. So those were a single large kind of nudges. The most common group turns out to be uh, what we call small nudges. So this is where people take a whole series of nudges, which in themselves are, uh, they're working quite hard, but they're not as spectacular as, say, the organ donation nudge. But when used in concert, in collection, through the entire customer journey, the entire brand experience, they add up to a dramatic change in fortunes. And that's why we have uh, Don Boyd here to talk about the uh, Teacher Development Agency campaign, which is a brilliant example of uh, a small nudge campaign. There's also two uh, quite sizable groups uh, which show uh, using price at the centre of a campaign. I, I don't think I'm saying anything that controversial when I say that price seems to be so seen as a sort of poor relation in advertising. So there's a hard distinction between proper branding and tactical price-led stuff. There's a strategy, a strategic tactical division, and there's a price brand division. So there's somehow something lesser about advertising that focuses around actual price. Yet what you see in a, a number of case studies is people brilliantly reframing price uh, to have dramatic effects on their clients' businesses. And um, the trainline.com paper is uh, a brilliant example of that. That's why Susan Paul is along tonight. It is intriguing, actually. Well, uh, you can tell me later if this is intriguing, right? But uh, 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 there's, a, there's a large selection of papers uh, from train operating companies because there's a, this isn't interesting. Now, as I say, I realize this is a very technical point, which only I care about, right? But they're under an economic constraint where prices are fixed by regulation and every single ticket must be sold by every single operator at exactly the same price, which completes, completes I know I said it was thrilling, didn't I, right? So this means that the only way you can compete is in the way that you frame that price. You can't compete with the actual price, only the way you talk about it. But that creates a fascinating playground for the marketer's skills. In fact, so there's actually a number of train operating company papers that do that in a, a way that uh, I personally find uh, fascinating. I often curl up at night with all of those Virgin <laughs> Trains case studies. So there are also a positioning campaign. So the advertising has long worked to, I mean, positioning is something we're familiar with. But the ability to uh, say what, where something stands in the marketplace rather than just what it stands for can have a huge effect on whether people are interested in that product. So, uh, and I think um, the well-loved Aldi Like Brands campaign is a perfect example of positioning. You take uh, people's simple rule in life that if something is cheap, it can't be any good. 
and you turn it on its heads by saying, well, why are things which are so expensive so expensive? Right? This is essentially what the Light Brands campaign does. That, And it does that by repositioning uh, brand names as something you didn't expect them to be. And we've still, obviously, we're very familiar with how fast Audi are growing as a brand and how they're challenging the main supermarkets. So what we've seen here is a sort of reinvention of the art uh, of positioning in many campaigns. And that goes very, I mean, it's a very, at the heart of what behavioral economics is, that basic idea that framing information, the way you tell the story, really matters. Finally, um, we've seen an impact in the way people choose to evaluate uh, campaigns and the data they choose to collect. So it's, uh, it's more of a technological change and a change in what's possible, but it's more and more the case now that case studies are built out of data which is about actual behavior. So uh, if you've not read the very earliest, it's quite common in very early IPA papers, which are drawing data from the late 70s or early 80s, that you simply wouldn't know how much stuff you'd sold in shops because no one was in a position to measure it. This, I know, to younger viewers would seem shocking, right? But, uh, so you relied on so-called X factory sales, the stuff that had left the factory. That was the best guess of what you had. Once it went out of your factory, it was just random. It was assumed that something happened to it. Now you have electronic point of sale, and then you have Tesco Club Card and Dunhumby and all those things, and every last gasp of that product is recorded from beginning to end. And we can look at all that data. And obviously in an online world, we have endless data points where we understand what people are really doing. But that's changing the way people are evaluating marketing campaigns. And there's a, a couple of case studies which are really been an example of that. One for Link Social which uses a very carefully designed research, research study using two match cells of respondents to show whether or not exposure to social media had changed actual buying behavior, which is more exciting than I make it sound there, I promise you. Uh, and the second one for the, the Transport for London and Olympics uh, campaign for, for 2012 and getting people to shift their transport behavior. I'm sure as you all work in London, you'll remember the Get Ahead of the Games campaign. But that's uh, an excellent example of a paper that very carefully divides out data about real behavior and only uses reported behavior, intended behavior as a proxy when absolutely necessary. So those are the five uh, areas. So I absolutely course, urge you to read the publication, not just because it took several months out of my life to write it, but because it's full of um, brilliant case studies. You know, there are lots of brilliant case studies in IPA effective laws, but it's full of some genuinely inspirational papers uh, and there's also there are some uh, sort of best, uh, best practice I said best practice <laughs> there was always going to be a moment when I, the, I I would boob in that manner I suppose it's all that I know make a tit of myself right? so I just just get it all out make a breast of it etc get it off my chest okay it's over now okay um, so there are a number of best practice takeouts that you can follow uh, in the book. So it is well worth reading. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Rory back to the stage, but also Susan and Dom to go through uh, our case studies and the panel.